Well, good morning, everybody. I'm sure you know this, but water is a pretty big deal in our universe. Uh, you might know that uh, 70% of our planet is covered with water. I recently learned that uh, people who are a lot smarter than us uh, believe that in the decades to come that water will become uh, the greatest commodity and the, that thing over which even people might fight over. Uh, you might know that your body, the human body, is made up of 60% water, that every cell in your body has water and needs water, that it's water that regulates our body temperature, lubricates our joints, transports carbs and proteins in the bloodstream, and acts as a shock absorber, didn't know this, uh, for the brain and the spinal cord. And that water matters not only in the planet, but it matters in your life. So uh, because of the odd job that I have as a pastor, I started thinking about the subject of water in the Bible. And I know that sounds kind of weird, but it's what pastors do. And uh, you need to know that in the Bible, that water is mentioned in the first chapter, in Genesis chapter 1, and it's mentioned in the last chapter, 66 books later, in Revelation chapter 22, that there are 700 Bible verses that have the word water in them. See, the image of water in the Bible has all kinds of meanings, and most of them are really positive and good. The idea of spiritual birth is connected to water. In John chapter 3, when Nicodemus, a religious leader, came to Jesus at night, uh, Jesus told him that he needed to be born again of water and the, the spirit. You see, when an expectant couple, they go into full alert when the pregnant woman's what? Water breaks. Yeah, because it means that there's about to be a new birth. It's about to happen. Another powerful water image in the Bible is the idea that water is what cleanses us. In the Jewish sacrificial system, in the Old Testament, for example, the priest who represented God's people uh, before God had a ceremonial cleansing that he had to go through before and after making a sacrifice. So by the time we get to Jesus in the early church, this idea of water and cleansing gets connected to this baptism thing we do, sometimes sprinkling, sometimes pouring, sometimes immersion. It's this act and symbol of God's cleaning us up. Pastor West, who's on sabbatical now, his, his dad, Dr. J. Howard Olds, in his deep southern voice used to say, Sin's the kind of stuff you got to drown it to kill it. So it's water that cleans us up. Another uh, image in the Bible of water is the idea that water represents God's refreshing presence in our life. You might remember that in John's gospel, Jesus calls himself the living water. And that if we go to him, we'll never thirst again. I mentioned earlier that in Revelation 22, the last Mentioned in the Bible of water, here's what it says. Let anyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who desires to drink freely from the water of life. Who can come and drink this water? Well, the Bible says anyone. And Jesus is this refresher of our life who's like a cool drink of water on a hot Florida day. I told you that water in the Bible is lots of meanings that are helpful and good, but I also started to think about how water in the Bible has some opposites of that that aren't so helpful, aren't always so good. This week I thought about the story in the Old Testament, you know, it's in the book of Exodus. It's when the Egyptians are chasing the just released Hebrews, God's people, to the edge of the Red Sea. They think they've got them trapped. Then Moses, he becomes God's instrument to, to part the Red Sea. And you remember that God's people walk on dry water, through, or dry land through the middle of the water. But then when the, when the Egyptian soldiers come, well, the water falls in on them. And it seems to me that water can either drown us or water can deliver us in the Bible. That water can ruin us or water can restore us. That water can help us or that water can hurt us. So for the past six weeks, um, since Easter Sunday, we've been in this series of messages called Come Hell or High What? Water, yeah. And the truth is that high waters come and we get to choose. You and I get to choose. Will these hellish high waters drown us or will they deliver us? Will they ruin us or will they restore us? Will they hurt us or will they help us? And this is where this issue of faith in Jesus comes into play. You see, our faith, your faith and, and my faith is what I want to call this morning the X factor. It's what makes all of the difference. You see, with faith in trust in Jesus, 
With faith and trust in Jesus, we can go through hell or high water and we can emerge delivered and restored and helped. Or frankly, the opposite is also true. And some of us know this to be true. Without Jesus, without our faith in Jesus, we can go through hell or high water times and live distressed, drowned, ruined, and hurt. So for these weeks, we've been kind of anchoring ourselves in a text to help motivate us all to have a high trust relationship with Jesus, come hell or high water. Hebrews 11, chapter 1 has been one of them. Let's read this together. Ready? Go. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. You see, when waters rise, when come hell or high water in our life, our faith is that which allows us to float instead of drown. A second anchor verse for us in these days has been 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Let's read this together. Ready, go. For we live by faith and not by sight. So Paul, who wrote these words, he's advocating living by what we know to be true and not by what we see. We walk by faith and not by sight. When I think about that, I love the Old Testament story about uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego these three Jewish boys in the Old Testament book of Daniel. I tried to convince my daughter-in-law to name our grandchildren Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I just thought that would be so cool. She voted against it. See, it illustrates this idea of walking by faith and not by sight. A King Nebuchadnezzar, best king name in all of the Bible. King Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon, and he was an arrogant dictator who made a 90-foot gold statue of himself and made it the law of the land that everyone had to bow down and worship the idol or be burned in the fiery furnace. I tried to get our leaders to make one of those of me, but they voted against it. Yeah. So the three godly men refused King Nebuchadnezzar. And they spoke to the king very respectfully, but very defiantly. These bold and faith-filled words, Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. Shadrach Meshach and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He's the God of the impossible. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, say that with me, but even if he doesn't, you might want to write that down, but even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your God's or worship the gold statue you've set up. Now, I don't know what you call that, but I call that come hell or high water faith. God can deliver me, but even if he doesn't, we're never going to bow down. You see, their faith expends beyond an immature faith. An immature faith that believes if I do good things, then good things will happen to me. If I do bad things, well, then bad things will happen to me. They were living right, listen to me, they were living a righteous life, and they were still thrown into the furnace. Their their faith echoes that of Job. You remember Job, the guy who had all of those problems in his life, who declares it right in the middle of his problems in Job 13. He says, though God slay me, yet will I hope in him. This week I was watching a movie with my wife Cheryl, and the best line in my estimation in this movie was a line where this woman says to her friend Joseph, we'll never get used, and like listen to this phrase, to the Lord's rough ways, Joseph. Would you agree with me that there's some mystery to the Lord's rough ways? That we're all going to go through some come hell or high water. But by the, time, uh, by the time we get to the end of this story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're thrown into the fiery furnace and an infuriated Nebuchadnezzar looks into the furnace and he sees their bold declaration and trust in God come to life. Look at what happens. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted. I see four men unbound walking in the fire unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. Now, I've always wondered who that fourth person in the fiery furnace was. Many scholars think, by the way, that it might have been Jesus himself. But here's the deal. They had faith, and they were still thrown in the fire. And sometimes we're going to have faith. We're going to have the right kind of faith, high trust relationship with Jesus. And you're going to go through a fire. So today we're going to look at one more teaching on faith by Jesus. And this one is going to challenge us. It's going to push us a lot. So we're going to read the story first. It's found in both, 
or all three, Matthew, Mark, Luke, all three of the four Gospels, and we're going to look at the one in Matthew. At the foot of the mountain, a large crowd was waiting for them. A man came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. Now listen to what Jesus says. You faithless and corrupt people. How long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. And then Jesus rebuked the demon and the boy and left him. And it left him. And from that moment, the boy was well. And afterwards, the disciples asked Jesus privately, why couldn't we cast out that demon? You don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. I tell you the truth, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there and it'd be moved. Nothing would be impossible. But this kind of demon won't leave except by what? Prayer and fasting, yeah. So let's be real honest, okay? Everybody, let's be real honest. This is one of those stories that makes us squirm. It leaves us kind of scratching our head because every one of us, if we're honest, we know that not every unanswered prayer for God's healing or for his provision or for somebody to come to know Jesus is a result of of, of lack of faith. So what is it that Jesus is teaching us in this story? Now, let me be really honest with you. I have never in my 22 years here wrestled harder or longer or more with the Bible text than I have over a month with this very text. I've read everything I could find on this Bible text, on the teaching of Jesus. And today's message is not going to be some really tight, simplistic answer. But I'm going to try my best to help us all. To understand what is it that Jesus meant when Jesus said that if we had the faith the size of a mustard seed, we could move mountains. So let's kind of work our way through the story. So the story begins with a desperate father who brings his son to nine of the disciples who are following Jesus. Now some of you are thinking right now, "Um, Pastor George, I know you went to Bible college and seminary, but there weren't nine disciples, there were 12. And you would be right. But here's the deal. See, three of them were missing. Peter, James, and John had been on this little excursion with Jesus to the mountaintop. We call it the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus does this really cool Star Trek, Star Wars thing where he morphs right in front of them. He becomes this kind of angelic, uh, heavenly being right in front of these three. And on the mountain, Jesus is revealing his glory, how amazing he really is. But they got to come down from the mountaintop to the valley below because there, the man's son, is devastated. This man's son is devastated by seizures that are so bad that the boy often harmed himself by falling into fire or into water. They had brought the boy to the nine disciples, and the nine disciples couldn't heal or deliver him from the demon. Now, I've told you before that you need to read a Bible verse in its context. And we believe that the best way to do that is to read a whole book to understand what the author is trying to say. Now, it's very interesting to note that just a few chapters earlier, Jesus had sent out 72 of his followers, two by two, if you will, on a short-term mission team. And he told them to go out and cast out demons in his name. And so they did all kinds of amazing feats. They came back and they reported to Jesus how they were able to, in the name of Jesus, cast out demons. So here, just a few chapters later, you can understand why the disciples are puzzled. Just earlier, Jesus had used them to heal and deliver. But with this boy, with this sad, terrorized boy, they could do nothing. So you're left kind of scratching your head. What was different? So so the exhausted, exhausted, exasperated father, frantic father, he brings the boy to Jesus. And Jesus hears how the disciples, well, they couldn't heal him. And so... They say, so Jesus says to his disciples, these kind words, (laughs) you faithless and corrupt people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. My friend J.D. Walt, he makes this simple commentary on this verse. Like a coach on the sideline of a team getting beaten badly, Jesus went Bobby died on them. (laughs) You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Jesus was not speaking to the crowd And he was certainly not speaking to the boy's father. He was dressing down the team, a.k.a. his disciples. He was saying, it was as if he was saying, we've practiced that play every day for two years, and you still can't make it. 
Now, for those of you who don't know, Bobby Knight was the head basketball coach at Indiana University. Hated enemies and rivals of the University of Kentucky. And Bobby Knight used to have this propensity to lose his mind with his players. So Jesus here is indeed dressing down his followers. But don't forget this. Please never forget that Jesus loves these failed disciples. Jesus wasn't raging on them. He was doing something that we don't like to have happen in our life. He was correcting them very firmly. And there was something about their faith that Jesus says is inadequate for this boy. So then um, Jesus does what he does so beautifully. He rebukes the demon and the boy is healed and he's delivered and the boy is well. So Jesus gathers with his discouraged team and notice it's a private locker room conversation. And he wants to debrief their failed attempts at healing the suffering boy. They ask Jesus, Jesus, um, could you explain to us why we couldn't cast out the demons? Then comes the words that puzzle us the most in this story. You don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. I told you the truth. If you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it'd move. Nothing would be impossible, but this kind of demon won't leave except by prayer and fasting. You see, Jesus says that there was something about the character of their faith that was missing. But let me say this. Remember, our theology needs to be the whole Bible, Genesis to Revelation. When you read the four biographies of Jesus, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's very clear that Jesus often healed, restored people with no faith, no apparent faith on their part. Um, just two chapters earlier in the same book, Matthew 15, Jesus returned to the Sea of Galilee, climbed a hill and sat down. A vast crowd brought to him people who were lame, blind, crippled, those who couldn't speak, and many others. They laid before Jesus, and he healed them all. The crowd was amazed. Those who had been able to speak were talking, the crippled were made well, the lame were walking, and the blind could see again. And they praised the God of Israel. What do you note about those verses? Well, there's no mention of the faith of the people who were seeking to be healed and restored. It's also interesting to note that the story that follows this one in Matthew is of Jesus feeding 4,000 men plus women and children, likely numbering 10,000 people with seven loaves of bread and a few fish. And again, when you read the story, there's no mention of the faith of the crowd, the mention of the disciples. So here's the first thing we need to learn about faith and the power of God. It's that God is not dependent on our faith to do his work. God, listen to me, God will not be held hostage. The God of the impossible will not be held hostage by our lack of faith. But you also notice something that almost appears to be contradictory in Scripture. We also need to learn that God often requires our faith in carrying out his purposes. And we see that in this story. Jesus tells his disciples that they don't have enough faith. It's clear. Jesus says in some translations that their faith, well, it's little faith. And that if they had just enough faith, the faith of a tiny mustard seed, they could move mountains. You see, I think Jesus' frustration was that by now, after walking with Jesus for two, two and a half, three years, they should have been able to heal this boy. Scholars believe that Jesus spent 10,000 hours with these disciples. And I think Jesus was so frustrated with them because he said, really, after all of this time, you still can't do this. See, remember that the purpose of Jesus coming to earth was not simply to die on a cross, rise from the dead, and give us victory over sin and death and hell in the grave. Yes, that was his primary mission, but he had a secondary mission. And that mission was to establish a people, men and women, filled with faith who would focus on Jesus. And they would do, remember what Jesus said, you will do even greater things in my name. Jesus came to establish a people who would carry out his works in a broken world. So I think the disciples' problem in Jesus' day, and dare I be bold enough to say that Jesus' problem with his disciples today, has to do with the object of our faith. Because what I think happens in this story 
What I think you can tell from the, from the Jesus sending out the 72 to what happens in this story is that their faith had just slowly drifted. This is subtle. It was an impossible mountain for them, but some, somehow they were putting their faith in the wrong thing. So it seems to me that the good question for us to consider this morning is what can I do when I face an impossible mountain? Because like the disciples, we're going to face impossible mountains. Can you say yes to that? Yeah. So let me suggest that from this story we learned that there are at least three object possibilities to our faith. Here's the first one. Number one, I can put my faith in myself. Now when Jesus calls his disciples then and now, an unbelieving and perverse generation, let me be clear, Jesus is calling out our self-centeredness. You've heard it said that ego stands for edging God out. Well, Jesus nails us here. You see, our faithlessness is the worst part of our self-centeredness. Our inability to trust Jesus is the worst part of our self-centeredness. More accurately, you could say, our lack of faith in God is the root of all of our self-centeredness. That if we would keep our focus on Jesus, we wouldn't be self-centered. So how often do we hit choppy waters? How often do we hit our come hell or high water days? And our knee-jerk reaction, even if you're a faithful follower of Jesus, is to look to our own resources. Let me just let you know that it is not a faithful response to Jesus when you hit a mountain for you to say to Jesus, hey Jesus, I got this. Yet how often do we do that? How often is our knee-jerk reaction to some mountain, some disease, some problem, some diagnosis in our life to say to Jesus, Jesus, I got this. I love that story about Muhammad Ali. He's getting on an airplane, and he refuses to put on his seatbelt. The stewardess says to him, Mr. Ali, you need to put on your seatbelt, to which he responds, Superman don't need no seatbelt. <laughs> to which the kind stewardess responded, Mr. Ali, Superman, don't need no plane either. <laughs> Mr. Ali buckled his seatbelt. You see, it's this kind of hubris, this kind of arrogance, self-centeredness. Now, it's often more subtle and it's often more disguised that we have a tendency to lean into when we face a mountain. I can tell you that several weeks ago, the teaching team, we got into a noisy discussion. That's a Christian way of saying we fought. <laughs> about this here's what we all agreed all of the pastors and all of those on the teaching team agreed that faith often masquerades as our own desires that our faith can be selfishness selfish at times how many of us who have a child who's wayward and lost have prayed I want my kids to be saved because I'm tired I'm tired of being in pain now dive in behind that that prayer is not about our kid. It's not about God getting glory. You know who that prayer is about? That prayer is about us. You see, friends, the poverty of our faith is often the selfishness of our faith. And that can be what Jesus meant when he talked about having a little faith. But there's a, a second option we have in this whole faith journey and the object of our faith when we face a mountain is I can put my faith in the mountains. I can put my faith in the mountains. I, 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 one of the things that I discovered over the last month studying this text is that the ancient peoples thought that the mountains had these deep roots beneath the earth. And that when Jesus uses the metaphor of a mountain here, he's using the Jewish metaphor that was about something that was virtually impossible. These mountains, they are immovable. And isn't it true that when we experience a mountain, it can seem so large, well, we can't see over it, we can't imagine going under it, or even walking around it. Last Sunday after church, I had to go to a board meeting in Atlanta, and so I flew to Atlanta. I sat next to a woman whose cat had just died. Now my friend, my new friend, well, she was inconsolable. She had loved and nurtured this pet for more than 12 years, and I get that. Tears streamed down her cheeks as she shared story after story after story of her loving cat. Ironically, she never knew that she was sitting next to a pastor. <laughs> Sadly, here's what I discovered. The loss and the grief that was her mountain 
in that moment, it seemed too big to see over, too big to dig under, too big to walk around. For her, the only solution was tears and vodka. So sometimes we put our faith in the mountains. Now, we all agree that, 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 that mountains come. We, we all agree that there are some of those Lord's rough ways that we don't understand. They're hard to see over. They're hard to go under. They're hard to go around. And I love the story. It gives me faith. It builds my faith of David and Goliath in the Old Testament. David, you remember? He was a shepherd boy who challenged the mountain of a man named Goliath who was nine feet tall. And he was the undefeated world heavyweight champion of the Philistines. Now look at 1 Samuel 17. It's on the screen. Verses 41 through 47. Listen to the mountain moving faith of David. Goliath walked out towards David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals, Goliath yelled. Now listen to David's reply. David replied to the Philistine. Now notice the lack of David and the focus on God. You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come at you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I'll, cut you, I'll kill you and cut your head off. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know how great David is. Is that what he says? No. He says the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel, and everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with the sword and the spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. How often do we say to the mountains, this is the Lord's battle, and my great God, the God of the impossible, will give you to us. See, Goliath was a very huge mountain. David could not see over him, dig under him, or walk around him. But David, he had mountain-moving faith. It's been said of this story Saul and the soldiers saw Goliath and said, he's too big to beat. David saw Goliath and said, he's too big to miss. <laughs> you see, this is mountain moving faith. And the mountain was real. But David's hope was in the one who's bigger than the mountains, the mountain mover. Which leads me to the third option that we have when we face a mountain. I can put my faith in the mountain mover. Recently, a friend of mine uh, challenged me with a simple tweet. It said these simple words, let's write checks only God can cash. I like that. That's worth writing down. Let's write checks only God can cash. You see, this, it seems to me, is mountain-moving faith. It's what David had. It's trusting Jesus and nothing or no one else, including ourselves or the mountain. It seems to me that what Jesus was getting at with his disciples had to do with this very issue. Again, subtle but profound. Somehow between that first mission trip and this demonized boy brought in front of them, they had begun to put their trust in their own power and their own authority that ironically had been given to them by Jesus. They had become a bit full of themselves because of their proximity to Jesus. And you see, any faith, any faith or trust that isn't centered on Jesus, and Jesus alone, is faith poverty. Friends, it's simple. Jesus must be the object of our faith. Not Jesus' people, not the church, not your theology, Jesus. So let's get really practical. And Jesus helps us with being practical here. Let's look at the last few lines again, one last time. Jesus speaks to his discouraged disciples then and now. Verses 20 and 21. You don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. I tell you the truth. If you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there and it moved. Nothing would be impossible. But this kind of demon won't leave except by prayer and fasting. It's that last line. Jesus advocates for those who are going to move mountains to practice prayer and fasting. 
Now, why is it that Jesus singles out these two spiritual practices? It's because unlike any of the other practices, the practice of prayer and fasting centers our lives back on God and takes our focus off of ourselves and the mountains. You see, when I pray, when I really pray, my focus gets on God. When I fast, my hunger for food reminds me of my hunger for God. No wonder Jesus would say that prayer and fasting are those things that fuel our faith. You see, these are simple practices that reorient us back to Jesus. They're what I want to call a faith update practice that refocuses ourselves on Jesus. But people often say it doesn't work. Well, I love that line from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. The only people who say prayer doesn't work are those who haven't practiced it enough. And I would say amen to that. You see, prayer and fasting are the kind of work that we do, holy work that we do to keep our faith in Jesus. So we want to help you this morning. As you leave, there's a table in the center in the lobby. You would trip over it if you didn't see it. And it's got a whole bunch of these prayer and fasting guides. Your pastors put it together. It's a simple little guide to help you practice these simple disciplines to help keep the focus of your faith on Jesus even when you walk through the Lord's rough ways. Because let me just remind you, you're either coming out of the Lord's rough ways, you're either in the Lord's rough ways, or you're on your way to the Lord's rough ways. Can you say amen to that? Yeah. So it's not that we're not going to have mountains in our lives. It's whether we're going to keep the focus on Jesus or ourselves or the mountains. So you can imagine People regularly, because of my work, ask me to pray for them. Over the last two years, I've read two wonderful books on prayer. And the simple lesson that the Holy Spirit keeps whispering to me is stop telling people that you're going to pray for them, George, and pray for them. Right then, right now. Trust me to do mountain-moving things in their life right now. So here's the deal, my friends. God's given you the gift of faith. You have the gift of faith. Remember, it's given to you through God's prevenient grace. The question is, are you using it? John Wimber used to say that faith is spelled R-I-S-K, and that spells risk, yeah. You see, see, let's start taking mountain-moving risks Let's compassionately pray for those who are in need. Let's earnestly believe that the Lord of the the mountain movers, the Lord who is the God of the impossible, will supernaturally move mountains in people's lives. You see, Jesus invites us who follow Jesus to have mountain-moving faith. So let me say to you, Grace Church, this morning, go, go, go and move mountains in Jesus' name. Let's pray. So, Lord, um, some of us are in mountains, or we know people who are. We're facing them. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that today, the power of your Holy Spirit, that as we make this movement towards this gift of communion, that like prayer and fasting, it'll refocus our faith on you, that we won't be so focused on ourselves or on the mountain, but we will with laser-like precision focus our faith on Jesus who said that if we had but the faith of a mustard seed, we could say to the mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. We see it in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We see it in David, and Lord, we want it in our life too. So thank you for this gift of refocus that we come to this table, not counting on our goodness, on our righteousness, but on the righteousness that was bestowed upon us because of Jesus. So come Holy Spirit and bless these gifts of bread and juice and make them become for us a kind of spiritual food that refuels us to focus on Jesus. For we pray this in his name. Everybody agreeing said, amen.